Marino Show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Marino Show. I'm your host, David Marino. Today, I'm speaking to Lauren Marie Taylor. You know her as Vicky from Friday the 13th, Part 2. Also, as Stacey Donovan from the soap opera Loving, which ran for a long time, and she was on it for the whole duration of the soap opera. She's also been in films like Girls Night Out and Neighbors. I'm so happy she agreed to do this. I'm so happy to see you, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to be there. I wish I could be there with you because it's nice and warm where you are. That's where, right. Where Te- cold in Texas is warm for y'all up there. <laughs> Did you just hear my y'all come out for yeah. y'all up there <laughs> on the yeah, East make, Coast? Make me some Texas toast and I'll be happy. I have to say, I, you know, we've talked and I'm a huge horror movie fanatic, especially the Friday the 13th franchise. I loved part two. Um And, you know, that was, of course, the one that you were in. How did you end up being a part of the Friday the 13th franchise? How did that come to be? Well, you know, as a young actress in the city, in New York City, you know, opportunities come your way. I've been doing a lot of TV commercials, a lot of TV commercials and jingles and radio spots and what have you. And my manager got a call you know, for that movie. But before that, she wanted me to get just some film experience. And I was actually handpicked by Woody Allen to have just a teeny tiny, you know, um, like a background type of role in his movie Manhattan with Mariel Hemingway. So that was kind of cool because, you know, he t- he directs you even if you're not one of the big name stars that are in the movie with him. So that was kind of cool. And I got to see how a film work is very different, obviously, from stage, completely different, but different from shooting a commercial. So that was a great experience. So when the opportunity to audition for Friday the 13th for a roll, 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 roll came up, um, came up, I was I was thrilled. I thought it was really cool. And I didn't know anything about it, you know, because I think the first one had just come out. So I really didn't know anything about it. And uh, I was lucky. I was very lucky. They, it was for an all-American girl. And the casting director knew me from commercials. I got called in. I read. And a couple of days later, I found out I had the part. They're like, pack your bags. You're going to camp. And y'all filmed the second one. Was it in Connecticut? Yeah, in Kent, Connecticut. The first one was in Blairstown, New Jersey, where the famous Blairstown Diner is. What are some memories that you have of filming part two? Oh, um, well. <laughs> and by the way, as we're talking about that, I see you have all of your kind of memorabilia behind you on the wall. I see a Friday the 13th part two looks like a oh. poster of some kind. Yeah. Yeah, it, it glows. In, it, it's one of those posters that that this dude hand makes. I can I can send you his information. Um, and when the lights go out, it's a different image that you see. Wow. So the lights on. And I think it's um, Mrs. Voorhees and Sackhead Jason. But if I turn the lights off, then it becomes a different image. And that's it's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that. Anyway. Um, oh, anyway, I mean, one of the stories, I, I don't really tell this a whole lot, but there's that scene where we're all hanging out uh, at the lifeguard post, right? And so it's Amy and um, Stu Charno, Tom McBride and me. Originally, I was supposed to continue on my merry way and go swimming in the lake with the rest of the counselors. And they were just going to go yuck it up in that scene. And I told Steve Miner I couldn't swim, which was the God's honest truth. It's not like I was afraid, you know, a creature of the Black Lagoon or something like that in the lake. And he said, are you kidding me? I said, no. I said, Look at my resume. It wasn't under my special abilities. I can't swim. I sink right to the bottom. So he's like, all right, and just, you know, join the group over there. So I think my only line in that scene was when Stu Charn was making a joke and I ad-libbed your face. So that was kind of a funny little moment. That's And everybody cracked up and Steve Miner left it in. So thanks to him for that. And I love the relationship on screen that you had with Tom McBride um, who has since passed away, but what was it like working with him? He was, I loved his role in the movie and, and it was just a nice chemistry between the two of you. 
Yeah, he was really cool. We knew each other from the commercial circuit, even though we never booked a commercial together, they would always pair us up because we looked good together. So then when we saw each other, when we were you know, going in to watch part one, because they got us all together to watch part one, when we saw each other, it was like, oh my gosh, I know you. And that was kind of cool. So it made it very easy to establish a relationship with him. Yeah. And um, like I said, I loved the, the chemistry that you two had together. And then we have to talk about like a few things from the movie that, that make me laugh that you do now at your comic or not comic, but your horror cons. Um, whenever I see in your little bio there on Instagram, it's like Vicky with the ugly undies because <laughs> They do show, and there's the scene where you change, but can you elaborate on, on how that kind of came to be and how you started using that in the cons kind of now as sort of sort of a thing with some of the fans? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it goes back again, at another Steve Miner thing. I had on those pretty black undies that were mine and satin was a thing back then, you know, in the late seventies, early eighties, it was a thing. And so, he wanted me to change into these satin underwears. And I was like, they're so ugly. He's like, Lauren, just do it. So for years, I tried to push the thought of the brown undies out of my brain. And then when I started doing the most recent cons, you know, for the 40th anniversary, I noticed that people were doing costume uh, photo ops. And I thought, oh, it's too bad I don't have cost that costume. And I went, hmm. So I said to my um, convention agent, I said, Stacey, I said, why don't I do a costume photo op? And she said, with what? And I said, well, why don't we look for a duplicate pair of brown undies? Very hard to find, by the way. Very hard to find. Because I didn't have them anymore. I burned them in effigy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm not kidding. I was like, it's like bonfire in my apartment in the city. I was like, oh. So anyway, so we, she says, are, are, are you being serious? And I said, yeah. I said, why don't we start a costume photo op with the brown undies and we can, you know, do a mock-up of the sweater, of the ugly, itchy sweater. You know, the worst things to wear if you're trying to like get somebody going, if you know what I mean. And uh, she, about a week later, she texted me and she goes, I need to speak with you. I said, all right. She, she goes, okay, are you being serious about the brown undie photo op? And I said, yes, I am. And she goes, you're not going to go back on it if I tell the promoters that you're doing this photo op. I said, I will not go back on it, I swear. And it just became a thing. So I, I mean, I pose, you know, I'm sure I've posted some pictures on Instagram, but I have to cut most of my legs off because my husband, who never goes on my Instagram, my husband one day was trolling me, right? As husbands do to make sure you're not doing anything silly, if you know what I mean. And all of a sudden I hear him go, <gasps> He goes, what's this? And I'm thinking, oh, I didn't post anything weird. So it's got to be something. I don't know. Maybe it was a picture of him in his underwear. I don't know. And I said, what do you mean, what's this? And he shows it to me. He goes, what's this? And I said, oh, that's the photo op that I do. He goes, you said it was a costume photo op. I said, it is a costume. It's my brown undies. I said, at least I'm wearing a top. <laughs> <laughs> So he was mortified. So I had to do this whole song and dance about how, don't worry, I wear another pair of undies underneath so that there's, in case there's a wardrobe malfunction, which is true, I do. And I wear pantyhose, which is not completely true. I did wear pantyhose in the beginning, but then when I went to Europe, my pantyhose ripped and I couldn't wear them when I was in Germany. So I thought, oh, the heck with it. I'll just do the photo out without it. And actually, and I looked at the pictures and I said, oh, my legs don't look that bad. So I just started doing it with bare legs and just the brown undies and the ugly sweater. I love it though, because I feel like that's really creative and it's such a, it's a unique kind of photo op for the fans, especially the diehard Friday the 13th fans. So I know everybody that gets to do that has to love it. Um, oh, yeah. I do. I do them where it looks like somebody's spanking me. I've done it where, you know, women come up behind me, you know, like this or jealous, jealous husbands, you know, with the wife looking at me, you know, I'll put my leg up on top of the person. You know, we do all kinds of creative things, you know, as long as there's no touching of the brown undies because they're sacred. <laughs> That's fun. Now, your killing scene in the movie. Um, talk to me about how that all played out, because. 
I know there's a, there's like a funny story with the, the blood capsules That's and, funny. and also we have to talk about, which I love this scene, by the way, I thought it was shot really cool. Just the way it looked with the feet going down the stairs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I really liked that. Cause that's always something you saw in the preview and it's still like a scene that always stands out to me. I don't know what it is. It's not like it's a bloody scene. It's just, I thought it was really creative and different to see like feet just going, being dragged down the stairs. So tell me how that, that killing scene all came to be. Yeah. I mean, you know, the cameras on this thing called a dolly, right? So it, it it's like train tracks. So the camera can move in and out at will. And you know, it's the first time, obviously, that we see um, uh, Sackhead Jason. And that wasn't Steve Dash that was in the bed either. That was um, Jerry Wallace. He was one of our crew guys. And he just put the sack head on and the, the overalls and the flannel shirt and everything. So, you know, neither Warrington nor Steve Dash were around for that. You know, you didn't need the makeup of, of Warrington and you didn't need Steve Dash to do any stunt work. So it was just a regular, you know, guy on the crew who did it with me. And um, I, you have these blood capsules, right? And it like any, you know, like a Tylenol type of capsule, right? But inside it's like little cherry flavored stuff like cough medicine. And Steve Miner wanted me to bite down on it at a certain point during the killing because you don't see her actually get stabbed in her heart or wherever she gets stabbed, um, you know, because she's a nice girl. So I think they wanted to, you know, make her death less ugh, than the other ones. Um, so I'm, I'm, I've got the, the capsule in my mouth and the camera's coming closer and camera's coming closer. You know, I see the knife sort of go into me if you, you know, fake go into me. And I knew I had to bite down on the capsule, but the capsule had been on my, in my mouth for so long that the gelatin on the outside got soft. So it didn't have that snap that it's supposed to have when you bite into it. So Steve Miner's like, Lauren, you know, you got to bite harder on it. And I said, Steve, I said, the capsules get soft. I said, I can't do it. You know, so I would like hide it in the back of my mouth and push it forward. And finally it did, it did break, but it just took multiple tries and it was getting frustrating for me. So when you see me really upset in that scene, I really am upset because Steve Miner was getting impatient with me. This is my first role in a movie and I'm getting upset because I just want to do my job. So any tears that you see it in my eyes, those are real tears because I was getting so upset about, about not being able to break the stupid blood capsule. And then they drag me down the stairs and everybody thinks that's a stunt, you know, person's legs. And those were my real shins getting slammed on those wooden steps. So they were very gentle about it. And I was like, doing it once and that's it. I'm only doing this once. But these days, the union would be our union. Screen Actors Guild would have been all over that in terms of, you know, fines and whatnot. Yeah. Do you keep up with any of the actors from Friday the 13th Part 2? Yeah, yeah. Um, I uh, keep up with Kirsten. Um, Obviously, uh, Bill Randolph uh, lives in New York City. So whenever there's a local con, we travel together. And then he'll just, you know, he'll text me out of the blue or call me out of the blue. Hey, Lauren. Yeah, hey, Lauren. Is You know, he's kind of fun that way. Uh, Russell Todd. And I keep up with each other. And of course, Warrington and I definitely keep up with each other. We're always going back and forth. For all these years later, after I believe part two came out in 1981, does it still surprise you that that people and also new fans have, have started coming along? Younger fans that weren't even around when the franchise was out. I mean, I remember watching it as a kid. Me and my yeah. dad would watch Friday the 13th because he liked Jason. He thought it was funny. My mom hated that I watched horror movies and was always saying your mind is going to get warped by those movies. And maybe it did, but I still loved watching them. And my dad and I just, we loved watching them together. Are you surprised by the, just the fan love even to this day? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I really appreciate it. Uh, Obviously I, you know, when here's the thing is when I was on the soap opera all those years, No one even mentioned Friday the 13th part two. No one mentioned Girls Night Out. Neighbors got mentioned because, you know, it was Belushi and Aykroyd. So that got mentioned a lot when they did press kits and things like that. But Girls Night Out and Friday were always swept under the rug a little bit because they wanted to step back, wanted to, you know, disassociate 
with the with the genre, with the horror genre, for whatever reason. Now people embrace it, of course. You know, look at all the shows on all the streaming channels. I mean, it's just, it's really blown up into just this incredible universe of horror. So when I started doing the conventions, I was overwhelmed because I thought, wow, really? This many people love this franchise? And, you know, in our little movie part two, it never occurred to us when we were filming it. And the love that's out there is just incredible. And, you know, every time I go out, I appreciate it all the time, even, you know, on Instagram, you know, people comment and follow and all that other stuff. I, it's just, I really appreciate it and enjoy it. And sometimes I'll be on the plane coming back from the convention and I'll find myself getting emotional. Like, wow, that was really a lot of fun, you know, cause like, like I was saying earlier, when we were just chatting before we started recording, there's a convention coming up down in Texas uh, next year. I think it's days of the dead. I know there are a few of them there. And I've, I've been to Texas once, I think when I was nine or 10 years old, okay, because I was visiting Oklahoma and a uh, family in Oklahoma. And I would love to go down there because you're, you know, I would love to meet you. you know, yeah, that'd be fun. Too. But it, you do, you, you grow attached to people because you see them all weekend. They come back to your table and, you know, sometimes they bring you donuts. I mean, it's just really sweet or they'll bring, you know, homemade things for you, you know, masks that they've made for you, you know, little Jason mask rocks. Oh, it, that's cool. Isn't it cute? It's a white rock. And this young boy named Eben, he uh, he made it. Isn't that cute? Oh, that is very cool. I love that. Yeah, it's cute. Anyway, so yeah, I, I'm overwhelmed by it a lot of the times. Yeah. You mentioned another film. Well, two films, Girls Night Out and Neighbors. I have to zero in on Neighbors because I remember watching that film also when I was young. I didn't understand everything about it back then. But, I, you know, John Belushi, Kathy Moriarty, Dan Aykroyd, you played the daughter. Uh Elaine. What a legendary group of people to be around. What, I mean... Do you pinch yourself today and think I was in a movie with John Belushi like these and Dan Aykroyd, he's still around. And so is Kathy Moria already, but they're all like geniuses in the comedic world. Yeah. What do you think back when you think about that you were in that movie? You know, at the time it was just another gig for me. I wasn't a big Saturday night live fan. I w- didn't really watch it a whole lot. I was always kind of busy on Saturday nights. So I wasn't, you know, I wasn't really up on that whole universe course I was a big fan of you know Animal House that was one of my favorite movies um but I didn't wasn't starstruck and maybe that's a New York thing I don't know but I was never starstruck because I felt like you always saw people you know on Broadway or on the street and and whatnot so when I got the gig I was just kind of like oh this is cool this is cool but when I think back on it it's like I always call it the best time of my life because I was doing an off-Broadway show at the same time and they would come and pick me up when the show was over and we'd go out and go to concerts and go to birthday parties. I mean, I got to see Meatloaf. I hung out with Carrie Fisher and Carly Simon, you know, at Christopher Reeve's birthday party. I mean, you know, who gets in a limousine with Carly Simon and You're So Vain comes up on the radio and you're singing with her. How cool is that? But if I can, do you want to hear a story about one of the yeah. others? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So John Alvinson, the director God rest his soul. He um, won an Academy Award for directing Rocky. Okay, big deal. That was his thing. But here he was directing a comedy. So it was the dinner scene where we're all sitting around eating the takeout. And he uh, he told he was trying to tell Belushi how to do funny, if you know what I mean. He wanted the scene to be funnier. And Belushi's just getting more and more frustrated with him. And the two of them were sort of going back and forth. Like, John, it's not playing funny. It's not playing funny. And so Belushi finally just stops everything, looks at Alvinson and says, can I curse or no? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. He says, because you could always bleep me out. He said, why don't you just take your fucking Academy Award and put it on top of the fucking camera so we know who the fuck you are? took off the napkin from around his neck, right? Slams it on on the table, hits his hands, gets up and walks off set. And Dan Aykroyd sat there and just rolled his eyes and said, well, I guess that's a wrap for the day. (laughs) (laughs) 
That- we all went to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> we just went straight from the set to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> oh, man. What was it like, you know, being around like Dan and, and Kathy as well? Oh, it was fun. It was fun. You know, she, you know, was obviously an up and coming actress at the time. So she was very, um, she would come to set very professional, do her job, and then she would leave. You know, she would go home. Yours truly, on the other hand, would come to set, hang out, go to Dunkin' Donuts, go get pizza afterwards, then get to the off-Broadway show, and then continue from there. You know, I just, I don't think I slept for three months I, because I was having too much fun. But um, here's a funny thing is um, Danny Aykroyd came. He had nothing to do on Easter of that year, right? And, you know, we had that car that looked like a hearse. And I said to him, I said, you know, I'm going to visit my grandparents for Easter and they live across the street from a cemetery. He goes, let's go. So we went to the bar, you know, and went downstairs. He, he said, what kind of beer does your grandfather like? I said, oh, I, you know, like Schaefer or something like that. One of those horrible beers, Pabst Blue Ribbon, whatever. So he brought a case, you know, of beer and we're at my grandmother's apartment in the projects in the Bronx, across the street from a cemetery where he parked the hearse car. You know, and we get upstairs to the apartment and my Aunt Phyllis, who I thought was the most, you know, I don't know, just not really into pop culture person. She pulls me aside from the uh, kitchen. She goes, isn't that that boy who's on Saturday Night Live? And I'm looking at her going, are you kidding me? Because I I had no idea that she watched it, but that was kind of cool. So he shared beards with my grandfather and that was a fun time. Oh, that's a nice story. It, that sounds awesome that you had all those experiences on the set of that film. As yeah. far as Girls' Night Out goes, that was another <laughs> horror flick, right? How did that, how did you get that role? Same thing, same thing. You know, you go in, you audition, um, you read, and, you know, a couple of days later, you get the phone call from your agent that says, you booked it. I mean, I met my husband on the set of that movie. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So y'all have been together since that film, since you met him that film. Yep, he played Bostwick. If anybody has seen Girls' Night Out, he's the goofy guy with the glasses and the beanie who bumps into girls when he's dancing and has cherry cherry chapstick. And yeah, so yeah, once in a while, he'll I'll yell down to him and he'll come up and make a little appearance on the podcast. Uh, But he's not home right now, so he can't. (laughs) And... We have to talk about um, loving because the soap opera fans are also another very devoted bunch. And I'm sure that you know that, of course, if anybody knew it would be you. But I remember seeing you on Loving because my mom would watch the soap operas. Back then, it's not like that today, but back then the soaps would run morning to afternoon, like all day long. And it was like one after the other. Loving was, you know, one of those shows that it lasted for a while. And again, your character, you were the only original character that started that stayed throughout the entire yeah. um, duration of the show, right? Yeah. Yeah. I had all three of my children while I was on the show. They wrote in two of the pregnancies um, <laughs> from one, for my last one, which my last pregnancy, which is my daughter, Olivia. Uh, they didn't write it in. So I still had to do love scenes with uh, the character of Buck with Philip Brown. And apparently he had never seen um, a very, very, very pregnant woman naked before. And I mean, you're not really naked for your love scenes. You know, you have your underwears on and you, on your boobs. You have these little things called pasties. So it basically looks like a, not a sheer, but like a skin colored bikini top, you know? I mean, basically you look like a stripper, but anyway, so... <laughs> They're shooting it from, you know, like uh, all the way up here or from the back. And I said to the director, I said, I'm, I mean, I was very, very pregnant. I said, I ain't getting under him. I, I said, Stacy has to be on top, even if it is out of character for her, because she was such a yeah, 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 good girl. And uh, so I climb on top of the poor guy, you know, and, you know, on his belly, of course, you know, I mean, there's no hanky panky that goes on. So I climbed up on top of him and the director said, whenever you're ready, just drop the robe. You know, we have the camera shooting you from behind. And I didn't look pregnant from behind because I, I stuck straight out when I was pregnant. And I dropped the robe and poor, poor Philip Ryan goes, oh, my God. And I said, what? He goes, I've just never seen anything like that before. 
I said, you've never seen a naked pregnant woman. And also my boobs were huge, you know, because that's what happens. You know, get filled with milk, you know, like cow. And the poor director had to cut because he had already started rolling. But they had that on tape. So during the Christmas party, they would have all the outtakes. And that was in the outtakes, his face going, oh, my God. (laughs) How did you end up getting that role on Loving? Oh, that was a process. I'd been auditioning for ABC soaps um, for all my children I had auditioned for. And I screen tested for a role, didn't get it. For Agnes Nixon, I, I screen tested for another role on Guiding Light or one of those. I, I didn't get that one. And finally, Loving came. And so it was a fresh new soap opera. It wasn't like I was replacing another actress. And I originally auditioned for a different role for the part of Lily, which eventually went to Jennifer Ash. And I got the callback after callback after callback. The casting director said, Lauren, we would really love to see you book this project, you know? So they, they, uh, we got the screen test. Everybody was screen testing on the same day. Brian Cranston was there. Everybody was there. So the guy that I was screen testing with, Chris Markentel, who also got his part um, as, um, as well, he and I knew each other because we did a planter's peanut commercial together where we had to do like a hold down, like a square dance type of thing. So we already knew each other, like, kind of like Tom McBride. And we did the scene and he said, you know what? Let's improvise. I'll grab you. And I said, and I'll slap you. And he goes, let's do it, but let's not tell them. So we go down there. And of course you're like, because you really want to book it. you know. And I was on my way to getting married too. So I really wanted to book it because I was like, I could use the money for my wedding. And so we did the scene. And then at the end, before they yelled cut, he grabs me and I slapped him. And then um, I was walking the next day or a couple of days later, I was walking to my job. I was a dog walker in the city in between gigs. So I was on my way to walking to, to my dog walking gigs on Park Avenue. And I got a call, you know, from my, uh, from my agent on, you know, on my, uh, on my house phone. And she goes, um, she looked at, you know, she leaves a message, call, call me back as soon as you can. So I get back, you know, um, obviously I was in my apartment when I got that, you know, when I got the message. So when I got back to my apartment after walking the dogs, I, uh, I, I, I called her back and she goes, you booked the job. And I said, what? And she goes, you booked the job. And I dropped the phone and I just started screaming. I was so happy. Yeah. Because back then, I don't think people realize how big of a deal it was to be in a soap opera because, I mean, they were on the cover of major magazines. You would see the soap opera actors. People really watched those religiously. Um, I'm sure at the cons, as much as you get recognized for Friday the 13th, do you get the same kind of recognition for the soap? No, and that's what's weird. Once in a while, I will. Um, People will come up with a scrapbook. Like one fan came up and had letters, you know, from the fan club that I had, that I had written. And um, I don't, I, I mean, I guess if I went to a nostalgia convention, I know they have those, because Diane Franklin and I were talking about those because, you know, she didn't just do um, um, Amityville Horror. She did a lot of coming of age things, a lot of TV things. So we were talking a lot about that. And she said, you know, you should really try to get to one of the nostalgia conventions because a lot of soap fans go to those and you get to see all these people who have known you for years, who probably wrote fan letters to you that you've wrote back to do. And I was like, yeah, you know, I, I should try to get into one of those. But when I was in Europe, that's where the loving fans came out because it was so big. Yeah. It was, a, I mean, I, when I went to Italy, oh my gosh, how many years ago was it like 30 years ago? I think it was. Yeah. Almost 30 years ago, I was invited to Italy to get a people's choice award there and the Italian version of the people's choice award. I actually had to walk around with a, with a bodyguard throughout Rome and Perugia. Yeah. And these were fans of loving. These are fans of loving. It was called Quando Seama there. And uh, they would follow me down the street. Uh, my husband always tells a story of being at the Vatican. He goes, there's Lauren looking at the Pieta and people, the Italian people looking at Lauren, looking at the Pieta. That's how crazy it is there. Wow. I mean, I was chased at one point. I was actually chased a few times, actually. Yeah, yeah. I was hiding from people. <laughs> it's interesting, like, and I'm sure for you as an actress, 
that kind of impact to know that you have that impact. Does that, is that just like freaky or just kind of like overwhelming to know that, you know, especially with loving that at that time to have that kind of get that kind of reaction from people. I, I was taken aback. I was definitely shocked when I was in Perugia, which is a very teeny tiny place. I went down the street to get some chocolates I didn't think anything of it. My husband was up in the room settling us in. I left without telling the bodyguard, Massimo. And I came back towards the hotel and unbeknownst to me, people had started following me. And I sat in the town square to talk to a few people, again, small town, talk to a few of the Italian fans and sign some autographs. And slowly more and more people started running because the event was taking place that evening. So a lot of people descended on that small town and I just remember sitting there and feeling, I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to be a huge celebrity because even in that small scale, there were probably about a hundred people in this really small area converging on me. And I was like, whoa, I mean, I couldn't sign quickly enough with the autographs. And my husband was, you know, he was on the terrace. He's like, oh my gosh. So we went and he told Massimo and Massimo came down and grabbed me out of the crowd. He goes, no, 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 no. And he started talking to them in Italian. And he said to me inside the hotel, he goes, you don't go anywhere alone. Trust me, you are very popular here in Italy. You don't go anywhere alone. And I was like, sorry, I didn't realize it was. (laughs) You just wanted to get chocolates. I just wanted to get real chocolate from Perugia, you know, real Perugina chocolates from the place where it's made. Well, I appreciate the work that you did on on the soap opera. I what I from what I've heard or seen other actors talk about that it's very um, disciplined and and you have to get your lines and they really don't like doing a lot of different takes. It kind of similar to stage work, like you got to get it the first the first take. Is that true? I, I don't. I was just curious if that's how it was. Yeah, I mean, writers write, you know, um, and they want their words that are on the paper coming out of your mouth. The thing about being on a soap opera is that they can edit it at any time. So, you know, you'd go through a series, a series of rehearsals. You do it in a room. Then you do it in front of the cameras. Then you go back and you get your hair and makeup done. You make sure your wardrobe is done. Then you have a dress rehearsal as if it's going live, like the real thing. Then after the dress rehearsal, you meet back upstairs with the director and he gives you notes you know, do it this way, cross on this line instead. And once in a blue moon, they'll say, we changed, you know, some of the dialogue here, memorize this right now. So part of the, um, the beauty of being somebody who was on it, playing the same character for so long, is that I could almost predict what my character would say. So that when I would get those changes, it would be, it was very easy for me to flip the switch and memorize it. But yeah, you do have to be very disciplined, you know, in every way, you know, health wise too, you know, you can't, sometimes you like before I went on maternity leave, I was filming five shows over a period of um, a few days, like 15 extra shows so that I would still be on while I was on maternity leave. Yeah. So it was, uh, it is very disciplined and it's, you're definitely working hard. There was an old saying on the set of loving because some actors, you know, who were coming on later in the years, they'd be like, oh, I'm sorry. Can I do that again? And it's like the old, old school people like me be like, no, no, just keep going, keep going, you know, make believe you're on stage, keep going until you get back on track. And if the director doesn't like it, he'll cut it and make you do it again. But that it's like, keep going, keep going. We whisper in each other's ears. (laughs) You do a podcast now and you have a lot of different people on, not just horror folks, but can you talk about what the podcast is about? Yeah, it's called the Not the Final Girl podcast. I've been on a little bit of a hiatus. Uh, I had COVID um, in November and it made me right on my birthday and it made me really lazy. Um, But anyway, so yes, so I interview people in our franchise, of course, and then some people from Nightmare on Elm Street. And then because I'm interested in it, I interviewed a paranormal expert. And that's kind of cool because that is kind of creepy and scary. Um, I have another guy who's a big movie buff. And we did a for Halloween, we did a special episode where he picks the most obscure horror movies. And of course, I'm more mainstream. So that was a nice. And then I interviewed a couple of cosplayers because 
they're very popular at conventions. And I'm always so fascinated by how they just transform and, and the women too. They transform themselves into these characters from these different movies that totally turn them on. So I, I interviewed them as well. So it's not just actors. Um, it's, you know, other people who are interested, you know, in the genre or in something around the draw, a genre like, like the paranormal. And if people want to catch your podcast, where can they find that? Oh, it's everywhere. It's on iHeartRadio. It's on Spotify, um, Amazon Music. There's a link on my, well, yeah, if you go to my website, it's laurenmarietaylor.com. One of the pages has all the episodes. And your website, speaking of, you just recently launched your website. I love it. I saw it. It looks really nice. Yeah, I did it with a friend of mine who's actually from Texas. Her name is uh, is Julie. So I did it with her and she's all the way out in California. So we were doing it this way through Zoom and I had my other computer set up. So we were sharing screens and it took a while for us to do it because, you know, she's busy too. She's busy out in Los Angeles. And uh, it was it was definitely a labor of love with her because she, I've been we've been friends for, oh, gosh, 30 years about. So it was kind of over 30 years, actually. So that was kind of cool. What other projects do you have coming up? Have you worked on any new films that will be coming out soon? Yeah, I actually have a horror movie coming out. I signed a non-disclosure, an NDA, so I can't really talk about it. But I can say that I drive a truck in it. uh, So the cameras were on the truck and I had like a three page monologue in it about death and things that die and things that die horribly. So I'm just a mysterious older woman so you know no makeup my hair is kind of ratty and you know we filmed it up in Canada which was really nice it was cold but it was really nice and I had a great time the young actors are so good and oh the ones that I worked with were just dolls and really good really good actors and really physical actors too which in a horror movie you kind of have to be you do a lot of running in a horror movie (laughs) you know when that's going to come out Um, They said in the springtime of next year. So I know they had to uh, reshoot a couple of things in late summer, early fall to match some other scenes that they had done earlier in the year. But they kept having they kept having freak snowstorms. So they had to stop production. Then they had to reshoot because then there was snow on the ground and they thought they couldn't see it. I mean, the poor filmmakers, I felt so bad for them because they're like, we got snow in May. <laughs> Is there anything else that you want to say to your fans, like both Hara and, um, you know, soap opera fans who love you? Is there anything that you want to pass along to them? Oh, just that I really appreciate their support and their love of both the soap opera and the movies and Handmade by Design. I still have people who enjoyed that, even though I was the most lame crappy person in the world but just the love that everybody shares uh i just want them want all of you guys to know that we really appreciate it i appreciate it and i hope i see see you soon you know 2023 right you're going to be doing some you're hoping to be doing some cons in 2023 yeah i hope to be doing some cons in 2023 i don't have anything coming up as yet. Uh, So you can always, if you know that there's one coming to your town, you can get all your friends to request me and hopefully they'll contact my rep and have me come because that's part of it too. They like, you know, they want, they want to know that people are going to come and, and visit you. But like I said earlier, I just really enjoy meeting everybody and hearing their stories and hearing what brought them to these movies because everybody's got a different story of who turned them on to these movies or who their favorite characters are. I mean, I know I have a favorite Friday the 13th and it's part six. So, you know. (laughs) Oh, Jason lives. That's a good one. I feel like the vibe in that one was, it was a little different the way they shot it. They incorporated some humor in it. It was different. I I liked it. Yeah, that's exactly what I liked about it. And, you know, and it, 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 yeah, it's a fun ride. It's a fun ride. The music is cool too.